Okay, welcome to uh, Developmental Psychology, Psych 236. Today we're talking about uh, the first two years of life, um, first two years of uh, cognitive development. So let's get started. We're gonna talk about all of this stuff. It's not a lot of stuff. So we're, we'll start by talking about depth perception, then memory, and then Piaget's theory, which will be a little bit annoying, kind of detailed. That's the most complicated and difficult thing about this chapter is Piaget's theory. You learn the simple version. If you took my 101 class, simple version of Piaget's theory, now you're gonna see the full complicated version of his theory. And this first part is a little complicated. And we'll talk about language, which won't be so bad. And uh, as usual, the PowerPoints look a little bit different when I present here from Canvas, but that says cognitive development. So we'll start out by talking about depth perception. Um, how do you test depth in um, infants? Depth is the ability to see at a distance, the ability to see, for instance, that let's say the car is uh, you know, far away or it's nearby. Or if you're on, let's say, um, a, a table, let's say the child is crawling on the table, that there's a drop off where the table ends and the child can fall, okay? How do you test that in children? You know, in, in uh, the first two months, especially, uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, a child that's just several months old, they can't really tell us yet. So they developed this experiment called the visual cliff experiment. We'll look at the picture in a little bit. It provides the illusion of a sudden drop off. As a matter of fact, let me show you now so you know what we're talking about. Right there, that's the visual cliff. So you can see there's a, there's a table and it has a piece of glass that goes uh, over the edge of the table and continues to where the mother is on the other side. And, you know, um, there's a piece of glass over and a cloth and it's very well cleaned and it looks like, like there's a drop off where the table ends and the child can fall. And the logic is, if that, is that if the child can be enticed to crawl over the edge to the other side where the mother is encouraging the child to, you know, to, uh, to arrive, um, then uh, that means the child cannot see depth, cannot yet see that distance, doesn't yet have depth perception. If the child doesn't want to crawl over the edge, that means the child does see the depth and is afraid and doesn't want to go over there, no matter how much the mother urges. So that's what we're talking about. So let's go back to the information over here. So depth perception, okay? Uh, results of this visual cliff experiment showed that uh, a six month old can be enticed to crawl over the edge. And that indicated early on to researchers that perhaps that six month old uh, doesn't yet have the ability to see distance, or the ability to see depth. 10 month olds refuse to crawl over the edge, even when enticed by the mother. That might indicate, or at least it did early on, that uh, they can see the drop off there and they're afraid and they will not go over the edge. New research, however, uh, where they've, um, they've added different kinds of tests uh, shows that uh, there's more going on than we realize. New research shows that even three months old know the difference between a solid surface and an apparent cliff and an apparent drop off. Their heart rate slows and their eyes are wide open when they are placed over the edge. So they got this three months old and they put them over the edge where it looks like they're sitting in midair there. Um, and when they do other tests, they, you know, they look at their heartbeat, their heart rate, it slows down and their eyes open wide, okay? Which might indicate that they do notice something. Maybe they don't understand it yet, but they do notice something. So what's really happening there? Well, infants can't really tell us so kind of have to guess from these experiments. Okay, uh, let's keep going. There's the visual cliff again. Now let's talk about memory. How does memory work during the first two years? Uh, so early memory, a, a according to classic developmental theory or early developmental uh, psychologists uh, believe that infants store no memories in their first year. They don't store memory at all. And there's a reason for that, why they believe that. We know better now, but um, it's because infants can't really tell us. Okay, so they believe that infants store no memory in the first year, but that's actually not true. Developmentalists now agree that very young infants can remember under certain conditions. Like if the experimental conditions in which they are tested, in which their memory is tested, if it's similar to real life, 
then they can they can show that they remember things uh, you know a bit more easily for instance if they're tested in a place that looks like a little play area right similar to home or something like that if motivation is high the thing about infants is you know they often don't care and they won't uh you know act as if they remember or do anything that would indicate that they remember not just do their own thing whatever they want to do if there are special measures to aid memory retrieval if there are things that are done to help them remember like you try you tie their for instance their their little foot to a little uh mobile that they can play with uh, to uh you know they can move if uh if you do that then they probably remember oh i can play with this and uh and they might make it move that little mobile example with the little mobile toy will come up again and again a little mobile is just basically when you put them on you know you put them lying down there and there's this little like arc over them and there's these little toys that kind of dangle there you know little things that move something like that uh more about memory research shows that three month olds can be taught to make a mobile move by kicking their legs so they tie their little leg to the little mobile and and they teach them to move their leg by moving their leg that they can make it move and i guess it makes noises it might even light up or something um and uh they can be taught to play that way if they can be taught to do something that means they remember uh, learning and memory go together six month olds can retain information with even less training less reminding okay and a one-year-old is capable of what we call deferred imitation which means they can watch someone do something and then perform that action later a nine-month-old can watch someone play with a new toy and then play with the same toy a day later in the same way that's deferred imitation deferred means that it just they do it later two-year-olds can remember re and reenact even more complex sequences a 20 month old can put a doll to bed, make a party hat, clean the table, even a week after seeing someone uh, perform those activities. So they do have memory, even in their first year, uh, infants. The thing is that you have to know the difference between what we call implicit memory and explicit memory. Children's memory uh, during the first years of life is more implicit. Implicit memory means it's implied, it's there, but it's hard to see uh it's memory that remains hidden until something brings it out for instance they may not show that they remember how to play with a toy until that toy is placed in front of them or until somebody makes them uh move the toy a certain way then they'll remember maybe uh implicit memory has to do with like motor skills habits emotional responses so let me explain motor skills and habits those are things that you do again and again particular things that have to do with movement and that's the thing about implicit memory we're talking about those things infants learn how to crawl they learn how to walk they learn those things that involves memory that's implicit memory okay so it's not true that they don't remember anything the first year it's just that memory is different memory has more to do with movements and emotional responses they may remember when they see for instance uh you know a cat uh, and they might start to cry because they remember that that cat scratched them last week right and they have that emotional response they can't tell you i remember the cat scratched me right but they emotionally they can show you or they recognize they recognize you and they're comforted by your presence so they do they do have memory for things that have to do with movements things that are repeated over and over again those are habits that are often concern movements and even emotional responses okay three month old can remember after two weeks to make a mobile move by kicking their legs right that's a movement that's an implicit memory but they need a reminder session right that you tie their leg to a little mobile and then they know to move it they can't tell us what they remember okay but they do have memory memory of movements habits emotional responses that's implicit it's implied we can't really see it but it's there if they can crawl that means they remember how to do that okay if they play with something a certain way that's also a movement that means they remember explicit memory is different explicit memory is memory that can be recalled on demand usually with words with explicit memory we're talking about things that we can usually say right Consci consciously learned words data and concepts explicit memory has to do with memory for basically facts um information okay uh and also episodes in your life so um so basically uh ah, i'm forgetting the word 
uh, for the facts and uh, information. Um, I forget, but uh, but uh, yeah, they can remember those those things. And then the um, memory for events is that's called uh, episodic memory, right? Explicit memory would basically mean you being able to tell someone, yeah, I remember I went to the park last week. That would be explicit memory. So usually things that you can say, words, right? Data, concepts, things that you did, that's explicit memory. That's usually what people think of when they think of memory. And uh, there's also implicit memory. And the point is that children show much implicit memory, but not a lot of explicit memory yet. At least during the first two years. All right, now let's talk about Piaget's theory. And this is gonna get a little bit, uh, little bit complicated, it's just a lot of information. Okay, even though we're only gonna talk about the first part of Piaget's theory today. Jean Piaget, right, uh, was a developmental psychologist. Uh, he got a lot of his ideas from actually watching his own children. Okay, and actually then proposed a theory. Uh, Piaget determined that infants progress through stages of cognitive development, that children go through different stages. And at some stages, certain things are easy, uh, but they're not capable of other things. And then when they get to the next stage, that thing that they weren't capable of now becomes easy. Okay, so, so each stage is like a new way of thinking, a new way of understanding. So according to Piaget, ch children learn uh, by adapting to their environment, or children learn and they adapt to their environment in two ways, okay? Assimilation and accommodation. Assimilation is easy. Assimilation is when you apply an old idea to something new. When you do the same thing with something that's new, like an infant that shows assimilate, assimilation, when an infant sucks on a bottle, the same way an infant might suck on a breast. So it's the same thing. It's kind of, you know, like sucking, basically. Um, infant knows how to do that, give the infant a bottle, put it in the infant's mouth and the infant will try to suck on that bottle. That's assimilation. Accommodation is a little bit more difficult. Accommodation is when you have to adjust the old idea for something new. Turns out when the infant tries to suck on that bottle and it's new to the infant, the infant has to figure out that sucking is not the same way. When the infant tries to do the same kind of sucking for the bottle and the, pre and the breast, that's called assimilation. When the infant eventually figures out that the bottle is a little bit different, that the infant has to adapt that old idea, that old idea of how sucking works, uh, to suck on the bottle properly. If I'm remembering correctly, and I think I am, uh, when the infant sucks on a breast, uh, the infant uses his or her tongue to push on the breast, to stimulate the production, of, not the production, but the flow of, of, of the breast milk. But sucking on a bottle does not, does not uh, involve tongue pushing. So the infant has to do that a little bit different. Uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, change the idea a little bit. That's called the accommodation. So when you do so the same thing for different things, that's called assimilation. That's like, you know, like if you've learned, for instance, that, uh, you, know, that you know, that cats should be avoided, let's say, because a cat scratched you. So you avoid all cats, right? Or maybe you avoid, you know, you see another animal and you avoid that animal. That would be assimilation. But accommodation would be you taking that old idea and changing it. So you adjust the old idea, maybe not just, maybe not avoiding cats, but only avoiding, you know, those cats that seem scary, you know, or the ones that, that are hissing or something like that. So you accommodate and you change the idea that when it's this kind of cat, then I can do this. When it's a different kind of cat, then I can, I, I, then I can approach things uh, differently. Okay. That's what I mean. I made too much of that point, but yes, assimilation, doing the same thing over and over again for different things. Accommodation is when you change it, right? When you have to change it somewhat uh, for that thing that is new. It requires a slightly different approach. All right, so let's talk about uh, Piaget's theory. Piaget said infants progress through stages of cognitive development. They go through four stages, and the stages are the sensory motor period, which spans birth to two years. That's the stage that we're in right now. That's what we're gonna talk about today. And then you have the pre-operational period, concrete operational period, and formal operational period. And we'll talk about those later. Okay, not today, not for this lecture. And the sensory motor period is further broken up into primary circular reactions, secondary circular, circular reactions, and tertiary circular reactions. And this is what's gonna get a little bit uh, more difficult and complicated is that 
it's broken. This stage is broken up into basically stuff sub stages, and um, and there's different things that the infants are capable of during this time. Okay, but I will can tell you that the sensory motor period is called the sensory motor period because what infants can do has a lot to do with their senses. They can see, hear, taste, touch, right, and movement, and you know the things that they do that have to do with movement. Okay, um, so. They're not capable of much. That's why it's called the sensory motor pair, but, but it's still broken down into sub-stages. So uh, let's, uh, let's talk about that. Okay, so let's talk first about primary circular reactions. And circular reactions, by the way, just means that, um, you know, that they happen again and again in a predictable way. And primary means that it has to do with things that have to do with the infant's own body. So primary circular reactions are responses that the infant does that involve its own body. Not other things that will come later, but responses to its own body. Like stage one is called the stage of reflexes, okay? So birth to about one month, the infant will explore his or her reflexes. The infant will suck, grab, stare, things like that. It's just exploring, it's just using, uh, you know, basically things that it already has, you know, that are kind of biological hardwired. It knows how to suck, it knows how to grab, it can, the infant can stare, and it does those things over and over, you know, for its own body. So this infant may suck their thumb over and over without really thinking, it just sucks his thumb, or may stare, the infant may stare at, you know, his or her hands. You know, that's the stage of reflexes. Stage two is a little bit different, one month to about four months. It's the first acquired, acquired adaptations and habits. So here, the, uh, the, uh, the reflexes, uh, what, the, 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 what the infant is doing, is doing changes from reflexes to deliberate actions. So now the infant isn't just sucking uh, on the thumb, uh, on, on his thumb, let's say, because, because that's what he knows how to do. But now the infant is doing that deliberately. The infant sucks thumb deliberately, does it on purpose, not just by accident, okay? Not, not just because of reflexes. Reflexes, you can't really help. It's just things happen in a certain way. So sucking is a reflex. If you put something near the infant's mouth, the infant, thumb, thumb gets near the infant's mouth, the infant will suck that thumb, put a ball near the infant's mouth, and the infant will suck that ball. But during stage two, when they start showing those first habits, those first adaptations, they will do that deliberately, not every time. They will do it deliberately. The infant will suck its own thumb deliberately or will pick up a ball and, and suck on the ball because the infant chooses to do so, okay? It's a deliberate action. Um, and they can differentiate between objects, right? A pacifier and a breast. That's what I said about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, with this thing with, uh, with sucking, is that sucking on a breast is different than sucking on a pacifier or, you know, which is be similar to sucking on a bottle. Uh, sucking on a breast requires tongue pushing, but in a pacifier, it does not, or in a bottle, it does not. So that's primary circular reactions. Stage one, stage of reflexes, the infant does something just because biologics hardwired, they can't help it. That's just what they do. And then stage two, those reflexes now become deliberate. They do them on purpose. They do them because they choose to. Let's keep going. And we enter the stage of uh, secondary, the, uh, the stages of secondary circular reactions. Secondary circular reactions, um, they're circular reactions. They are things that happen over and over again, um, but they're called secondary because now those reactions are used for basically objects and people. So they're secondary things, not primary things that just have to do with them, but now they do things that involve other people or objects. So stage three. Um, four to eight months, an awareness of things, okay? So the infant will vocalize, stare, smile at objects, smile, stare at a ball that the infant wants, basically, uh, you know, wants to look at or the infant wants to play with, right? Uh, to make interesting events last or like this, you know, little girl here will gaze at, uh, you know, her, her daddy, uh, basically to keep his attention. So the child is aware of objects and people that are around them and they basically do things over and over in order to, um, to basically to make those interesting things or things that are interesting, uh, interesting to them last. Um, 
So they'll shake their arms, they'll laugh when you put a rattle in their hand, okay? They'll gaze, smile at mom or dad to keep their attention. So now they're responding to uh, not just things that have to do with their own body, that have to do with reflexes, but now they're, they're doing things that actually involve other people or objects. They become more aware of them and they do things uh, to continue to get some enjoyment out of you know, those things, you know, those objects or mommy and daddy when they look at them. Okay, uh, that's stage three. But there's more to secondary circular reactions. There's also stage four uh, of secondary circular reactions. Stage four is new adaptation and anticipation. So here the infants start showing what we call goal-directed behavior, where they'll do something in order to achieve a certain goal. So the infant might grab the soap and show it to mom, basically saying, hey, it's time for the bath, okay? Or the infant might you know, grab the bottle and show it to mommy and say, hey, time for you to give me some more, okay? Because this thing's empty. The infant will tug at mom to keep mom from leaving, so another example, so there's a goal in mind. The infant is trying to achieve something, okay, some goal. Not just to try to maintain something, but to initiate something, to make something happen. And children also develop what's called object permanence uh, during stage four, during, you know, stage four of these circ secondary circular reactions, okay. Object permanence is, uh, is understanding that an object or, or someone, something basically exists when they don't see or hear that thing or that person. So just because let's say a ball, they don't see a ball, doesn't mean the ball stops existing. Or just because mommy should walk out of the room doesn't mean that mommy doesn't exist anymore. But infants have a hard time with this uh, before stage four, okay? Early on, Piaget believed that it takes up to about maybe year two for infant, infants to acquire object permanence. Now they acquire object permanence in as little as as basically uh, nine months. But mo most infants uh, will be a little bit later. So object permanence, how do you know if a child has object permanence? Take a little ball and uh, you know, show it to the, the child and the child will be interested in the ball, okay? But if you take that ball and you put it under a blanket, if the child does not have object permanence, the child will ignore the ball, won't look for the ball under the blanket. The child doesn't know the ball is even there. So out of sight, out of mind. They don't see the ball, they don't hear it. it. Might be a squeaky ball. It's not squeaking, they can't see it. It doesn't exist anymore. But as they get older and they develop object permanence, if you take a ball and you put it under the blanket, they will reach under there and grab it. That means they have object permanence. They still remember the ball even when they don't see it. And when children don't yet, uh, or when they are developing object permanence, um, right around this time before they develop to a little bit after uh, they enjoy a game called peekaboo where you know you you can cover your face with your hands and then uncover it your, your uncover your face open your hands uncover your face and say peekaboo right and you do that with the child or you can use a blanket cover your face and then uncover your face with the blanket and go peekaboo right and it's like you're appearing it's like you're uh, you're appearing and disappearing so when you're covered, you disappear. When you're uncovered, you appear. And that's called peekaboo. And children really enjoy that from seven to 12 months, right around the time that they're developing this idea of object permanence. It's interesting to them. As they get older, they will not enjoy that anymore. They will have object permanence. They'll understand that and it will no longer be interesting. All right, let's keep going. So now you know why children enjoy peekaboo so much. Tertiary circular reactions, okay, happen uh, at stage five. Stage five, 12 to 18 months, children develop what are called tertiary circular reactions. Uh, new means through active experimentation, the little scientists. So children will try different things to see what happens during stage five. So it involves active exploration and experimentation. Okay, so here infants are trying to produce novelty. They're trying to, to produce something new not just repeat things over and over again. They're trying to determine if something new will happen if they do something, like that child there, which is playing with the vent. The child may have noticed that if, I think it's a little girl, maybe, I'm not sure, but the child may have noticed that if he or she uh, strokes the, uh, the vent, the fingers, maybe it makes a certain sound, okay? 
And uh, maybe the child will notice that if you, you know, uh, touch it over here, it makes a different sound than if you touch it like in this area. Or if you move it, your hand through it slowly, it makes one sound, but if you do it quickly, maybe a different sound. So it's, the child is being like a little scientist. They're trying, uh, they're exploring and actively trying things, trying to produce something new. Or a child may drop things from different heights to produce different sounds. Or a child may play with a, a little marble run, let's say, uh, if you know what a little marble run is, it's a toy, and uh, they'll put the marble in one end and let it go. And then they might put the marble in a different place and let it go down the little marble run. Or playing with a little car and a little ramp, right? Try to put the little car only halfway up the ramp and letting it go, or maybe higher up the ramp. Okay, that is, uh, those are tertiary circular reactions. That's stage five, where they're actively experimenting. Stage six of tertiary circular reactions. Stage six, uh, um, a, a little bit more advanced. New means through mental combinations. With stage six, uh, stage uh, six, children uh, now are trying to anticipate and solve problems. So now a child uh, will actually can actually try things mentally before doing them. Uh, a child might see, uh, you know, his brother run down the hall, and then notices that. Uh, that child uh, has fun as it runs down the hall screaming and the child doesn't get punished, right? So the child just observes, waits, and then the child does the same thing. It's anticipating and, you know, solving that problem or, you know, should I do this too? It's thinking, the child, the child is thinking before it does that. Pretend play begins, during the time that they will, they will, play, they will pretend, okay? The child will tuck the doll into the bed and pretend the doll is alive and that the doll eats and poops and all that stuff. That's pretend play. That's part of stage six. And deferred imitation is also possible where they copy behavior that's noticed hours or even days earlier. They'll pretend to use a phone uh, hours or even days after seeing mommy using the phone. And children will do things like that. They'll, they'll do some of the same things. They'll try to do some of the same things you do. So parents often will get them you know, little, you know, toy phones or a little toy hammer or a toy saw, something like that. So the children can try and do some of those same things that they do or a little toy broom or a toy rake or something like that because they begin to imitate. Now we mentioned deferred imitation before with regards to memory, but it's part of uh, stage six, uh, tertiary circular reactions. And that uh, was a lot of information, but here's a little bit of a review to make it simpler primary, secondary, and, and tertiary circular reactions. So, um, you know, with primary circular reactions, we're talking about actions and responses to the infant's own body, okay? Um, so the baby sucks, the baby enjoys sucking. Here, we're not breaking it up into stages though, just primary, secondary, and circular. So that's only one to four months there. It doesn't have the zero to one month where it's just a reflex, okay? Secondary circular reactions uh, are actions that get a response from another person or object. So we're secondary, we're talking about responses to objects and people. You know, and it leads to the baby to repeat the action. So the baby steps on a rubber duck or the baby squeezes the duck and then, uh, you know, the duck makes the sound and then the baby, and, and, and you know, the baby does that again and again to try to, to continue to do that. Tertiary, tertiary circular reactions, one action gets one pleasing result, leading the baby to perform a similar action to get the similar re result. Um, yeah, um, wait a minute. No, I skipped that. Okay, I did the wrong thing for, for secondary circular reactions. That has to do with the, the one, the middle one there. The baby coos, gets the parent's attention, and the, uh, you know, basically the, gets the parent's attention, so the baby does that again to, uh, you know, to continue getting the parent's attention. I was looking at the wrong image. With tertiary circular reaction, that's where the child does one thing, gets a pleasing result, and then tries to repeat that, okay? So baby steps on the rubber duck, the duck squeaks. So the baby tries to repeat that by squeezing on the rubber duck, and then the duck squeaks. So they're kind of experimenting, you know, trying different things, trying to get a similar result or a, a different result, depending on which stage of tertiary circular reaction we're talking about circular reaction. So now let's talk about language. Let's talk about, we're still talking about cognitive development, language. So I mentioned baby talk, simple high-pitched sounds, repetitive uh, language that adults use with infants. You know, like, you know, who's a good boy? 
I know you want to, come on, play with me now, you know, things like that. I, it's hard to kind of, for me to imitate that when I don't really have an infant in front of me or even a dog or a cat. Sometimes we do that with our pets, okay? But um, that's baby talk. And uh, we do that with our infants, uh, you know, kind, almost instinctively. And, and infants actually like when parents do that. But let's talk about language development during the, the first two years. Uh, newborns actually um, aren't, you know, their communication is, uh, is different. They, ha they have what's called reflexive communication. They'll cry, okay? Crying is communication. They're telling you that something is wrong. They're telling you that they're, you know, they're cold, that they're too warm, that they're hungry or tired or something like that. They're crying. Uh, their movements, you know, their little movements like, uh, you know, uh, they're, you know, moving their little arms, you know, their little legs might indicate frustration or something. Um, their facial expression, you can tell when they're sad, when they're happy, when they're content, okay? By, by the time they're two months old, they start making more meaningful noises. They start making sounds that we refer to as cooing. These are vowel-like sounds, right? You know, like, you know, little oohs and ahs, things like that, or eh, you know, little, they sound like vowels okay, that are extended, that's called cooing, okay? And there's also some fussing and some laughing, but the cooing is the important thing there. Uh, by three to six months old, you will hear squeals, growls, grunts, even, and even yells, okay? Sounds different, it's not just cooing, you're starting to hear some different sounds. By six to nine months, that's when babbling starts to appear. And with babbling, you have basically the repeated consonant and vowel sounds, you know, ba, 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 ta, ta, ta. And that babbling will eventually become their first words. But, uh, you know, they produce the cooing sounds, which are like the vowel sounds. And with the grunts and squeals, they're producing almost like the consonant sounds a little bit, like the R's and other things. And they start putting some of these sounds together and, and it sounds like babbling, ba, ba, ta, ta, you know, and that will eventually become their first words. First year, first words begin to appear. Mama, Papa, you know, things like that, caca, you know, that's the first year, the first words, they put those, those that, you know, that babbling turns into their first words. 13 to 18 months uh, of, of age, uh, vocabulary grows slowly up to 50 words, they're learning how to say more words, okay, they might know about up to 50 words by 18 months of age, but that can vary a lot, depending on how advanced the infant is. You know, some are more, are slower to develop a, a language and some develop it very quickly, okay. Uh, by 18 months, there's a vocabulary spurt, a naming explosion, where they're learning very words very quickly. Three or more words per day that they learn. And uh, most of these words are nouns. You know, they're referred to physical things, people, objects. So I think like pee pee, poo poo, na na, ta ta, kaka, you know, all these things that refer to basically things, okay? The words usually refer to people, animals, toys. Those are all nouns. Okay, physical things, that's what they understand. They're not gonna uh, understand symbolic things yet or things they have to imagine. So these are just physical things. They also begin to use hollow phrases. They might use one word to say many things. Like they might use the word ball, you know, to mean like, is this a ball? Or ball saying, I wanna play with that ball. So they'll, they'll use the same word to mean different things. And they also use overextensions. Like they might use the word car for a car, a truck, or van, right? Or they might use the word cat to refer to the house cat, and then the leopards, and the lions, and the tiger. Uh, actually, those, those are, that's technically not an overextension. Those are all cats. The car example is better. Well, they use one word to refer to uh, lots of different things. They'll use the word car to refer to different types of vehicles. That's an overextension. Let's keep going. Other language development. By 21 months, you start seeing the first two word sentences and they start to use grammar. You know, they might, you know, say things like more juice, baby cry, right? So when they start putting two words together, then grammar becomes important. The rules of what comes first, what comes second. Um, and they have difficulty with tense and they make uh, lots of grammatical errors. So a child might say, me go, instead of saying, you know, I went, you know, or I will go. They might say, you know, me go or something like that. Uh, 24 months, they start using what's called telegraphic speech, multiple word uh, speech. Half of the sentences are two or more words. You know, they'll say things like give baby milk, you know, uh, baby hungry or something like that. Uh, they, multiple word sentences. And uh, like I said, it depends on the child, okay? Uh, I will tell you uh, that, uh, 
you know, uh, female infants uh, develop uh, language much, much faster than boys and they'll be much better. And this doesn't sound like much at 24 months, but your typical girl might be a lot better than this, whereas your boy might be just at this, uh, at this, um, at this stage. Um, gesturing is also a form of language. All infants gesture, okay? Uh, concepts with gesture actually are expressed sooner than speech. So, so infants can actually gesture before they can even talk, okay? Um, before they can use clear speech. Gestures occur even without adult signing, okay? Um, they, they learn to gesture, to point at things, you know, or to make certain movements to indicate certain things. Pointing emerges in human babies at around 10 months. Um, but because of that, you can start to teaching, teaching uh, if you want to, you can teach uh, children sign language and they can gesture for certain things before they can even say those things. See, this mother says it here, uh, it, she says, uh, this mother is teaching her 12 month old daughter the sign for more, a word most toddlers say several months later. Let's keep going. Uh, now let's talk about some things that are a little bit easier to understand. Uh, actually, it's only Piaget's theory, which was a little bit complicated there. Uh, theories of language development. Uh, theories that try to explain language and how it arises, where it comes from. Um, there's, the, uh, there's behaviorism, which was proposed by Skinner. Uh, behaviorism is a theory that says that basically everything is learned and we learn things because of reinforcement. So according to Skinner and other people who advocated for behaviorism, they say that infants learn language by associating words with objects, especially if there's reinforcement, especially if there's some kind of reward. So a parent might teach an infant by repeating a certain word and providing objects, smiling when a word is used correctly. So here is your bottle, right? Say bottle, good, right? Children will imitate people. Or look, here is a, here's a little toy car. Can you say car? Car. And the infant says car and you say good and you smile you reward the infant for using that word and according to behaviorists like skinner we reward children for basically making these sounds and as they get older we reward them for language that gets more and more complicated we stop rewarding them for language that is simple because they you know they should be able to produce more words now and more complex language and we reward them for more complex language and we continue to reward them um, all along the way and uh, and their language becomes more and more complex so we do things because we're rewarded for them that's behaviorism okay and we develop language because we are rewarded for that language so the child might start with certain sounds like cooing oohs and ahs and what happens is uh, you get happy when you hear that as a parent and you smile and you talk to the infant, you reward it. You just reward the infant for cooing. And then later on that cooing will turn into babbling and you'll get happy when you hear that too. And you'll get very happy when you hear those first words. Uh, and according to Skinner, you are rewarding that child with attention all along the way. And the child keeps wanting these rewards and keeps saying and doing things to get your praise and your attention. You might even reward the child with a treat, a candy or something like that, or even a toy. And this is how we learn things and this is how we learn language, according to Skinner. But experts have said that this can't be the complete uh, story because they've said that if, uh, if, if rewards are all that matter, rewards and maybe even punishment are all that matter for learning language, um, it would take us about 100 years to learn language. And we learn it much faster than that. So there must be something else that's also going on. Um, here's something that uh, suggests that uh, there might be some truth to the theory of behaviorism for explaining language. Here we have uh, language acquisition, uh, you know, uh, and maternal responsiveness. So we can hear here we have uh, on the, the side over here on the left, we have the, uh, the scale there from zero to 100, the percent of infants knowing at least 50 words. And in the blue line there, the blue graph, we have infants of highly responsive mothers. And then we have, at the bottom, we have age there. And you can see what that blue line tells you is that infants who have mothers that are highly responsive, that give them a lot of attention and a lot of praise, that they develop language much faster than those infants who are, whose mothers are in the bottom 10%, who have mothers who are not very responsive at all. You know, those mothers who ignore their children, don't talk to their children that much, don't look at them that much. Those children are slower to learn language. 
and you can see there with by the purple line, it takes them longer uh, to you know to get to 50 words. Uh, you know, 21 months for about half of them to have at least to know at least 50 words. So the point is that highly responsive mothers, um, their infants learn language much faster. You know, being a nice mother, give the child lots of attention, talk to your child a lot, rather than ignoring the child. Uh, more about uh, language development. So, so experts have said that it's probably too slow, just with rewards and punishment, it's probably too slow for us to learn language that way. It does matter, it seems to be important, but that can't be the only thing. Chomsky actually said that we have something called a language acquisition device, that there must be a part of the brain, a brain structure that allows children to learn language grammar uh, very rapidly, because we seem to learn language so quickly. We seem to be hardwired for language, okay? Um, language development requires maturation of the brain, neurons, and pathways, okay? Reinforcement is too slow to account for the fast rate of language development. We learn it much too quickly. It can't be that you are rewarding that child for every single word that child is learning. So we must be biologically hardwired to learn language. We, there must be a certain part of the brain that has to do with language development. And Chomsky called that the language acquisition device. In reality, it's probably more complicated than that. There are many of the brain's areas that are involved in memory and in learning, and that also involves language, but there are specific areas of the brain that have to do with basically producing speech, you know, like Broca's area, and, and areas of the brain that have to do with understanding speech, that's Wernicke's area, if you remember from 101. So there's more than one area that has to do with language. And of course, it also involves learning and memory, which is all over the brain. Let's keep going. Social pragmatic theory uh, basically says that, you know, children are social beings. We are social and we acquire, acquire language as a way to connect with others, a way to interact with others. We're dependent on one another for survival, for joy, right? So we're compelled to be social as newborns and we vocalize, we babble, we gesture, we learn language basically because it's important. We have to connect with others and we have to learn to communicate in order to survive. We look intently as faces, we're attracted to the human voice. It's all part of basically the environment that we live in and we have to acquire language to connect, to interact, otherwise we're not gonna survive, according to social pragmatic theory. These are just some theories. Um, and, um, you know, they're all important. They all help explain language in a slightly different way, but they're all occurring at the same time, in my opinion. Of course, you know, there are rewards and even punishment that is occurring when it comes to language. And of course, the brain is helping, doing its part, and of course, also our environment and our relationships are helping us develop language. So they all apply. Okay, um, that is it. I need to now, um, I am going to stop recording.